welcome to the Contemporary Worship Service. We are delighted that you have joined us. Well, we are very excited to continue to get ready for your arrival for all three services in live, in, per, in person on October 11th. We hope to be recording the Contemporary Worship Service at 10 o'clock over in the Campus Center for those of you who maybe are not quite ready to come out yet. For those of you who will be joining us, just know that we will be moving gently forward in an effort to keep everybody safe, which means that we will ask you to make reservations the week before the service, and that while you're on campus, you would wear a mask all the way through the worship services, and that we're not going to be singing out loud. This is our opportunity that we have to get to take care of each other, and we so appreciate your patience as we navigate these unchartered waters. Well, we're still looking for a few people to join us in this growing digital ministry team. So if you prefer to be behind the scenes and you're open to learning something new, we would love for you to join us. We are so in need of these good, dedicated people to continue this ministry to reach all of the people outside of our walls. And if you are interested, please contact Sarah Soboleski. Well, we have started to offer some small-sized exercise classes over in the Palm Center with all the safety precautions in place. On Mondays and Fridays, we have firm believers at 9.30. We have chair yoga in, on Monday afternoons. On Tuesdays at 12.30, there's a regular gentle grace yoga class. And then Fridays, there's a vitality exercise class. Um, firm believers is like $3 per class. All the others are only $5. Such a great deal. So good for our body and our soul. So when you're ready to come join us, we'll be there for you. All of this information is on our website. The deadline is tomorrow to turn in your poster of what love is to you. Write it in, take a quick selfie, email it to Jackie, and you can get this poster on our Connect magazine. You can get it out of the e-blast that we send or on our website, or heck, you can even make your own Love Is poster. And remember, this month, as we are doing the Fruit of the Spirit of Love, Pastor Steve has encouraged us, challenged us to write a love letter to someone in our life. Well, our race and the church team will be hosting another book discussion on Monday, September 28th at 6 p.m. And we're going to be talking about the book, The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism by Jamar Tisby. We hope that you will join us as we seek to understand better our past as a church so that we can chart a course forward that is helping us to love all of our neighbors of all creeds, of all cultures, and all races. We hope that you will join us in this important conversation. Uh, the Zoom link will be on our website. It is not too late to join a Love Does small group, contact Pastor Mingy, or to join us any Wednesday morning at 9 for Lectio Divina, or to join Pastor Steve in the God in Hollywood. And this week on Wednesday at 6.30, they're going to be discussing the movie Tender Mercies. We want to thank you for your faithful giving throughout this pandemic. The four ways you um, can give are, of course, on the screen as a reminder. And we just want you to remember that any amount that you give counts. And we hope that God blesses you richly in your giving. Because of your generosity, we have been able to love and serve our neighbors in a variety of ways. One of those ways is through feeding the hungry. And we are so happy to show you a little video that we have been, of all that we've been able to do through our food pantry during this pandemic. And as we mentioned last week, we are still in need of some volunteers to pack and distribute food. And we hope that you will go to our website or call our front office to volunteer. So now let's take a look at this wonderful ministry.
Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. It's 
rest on signify a grace. The creation sings your praises so loud. The one who never leaves, the one 
We are at that special time in our service where we get to offer our prayers to God. We get to confess our sin and receive forgiveness. Marion had emailed me and asked for uh, special prayers for her granddaughter's friends, Mighty Millie, a little three-year-old who will be in the hospital um, for a couple of days as they take a look at some scans to see if the radiation and chemo have been working as well as to get another big round of chemo. We know that there are so many hurting people suffering from physical, emotional, and relational stress. And we lift up these people and the pain that is felt from racial injustice, natural disasters, and political divisiveness. With this and whatever else you have on your heart this day, let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we begin this new week, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit into our lives. Open our ears to hear what you are saying to us in the things that happen to us and in the people we meet. Open our eyes to see the needs of the people around us. Open our hands to do our work well, and to help when help is needed. Open our lips to tell others the good news of Jesus and to bring comfort, happiness, and laughter to other people. Open our minds to discover new truth about you and the world. Open our hearts to love you and our neighbors as you have loved us in Jesus. And for all the times we come up short or fall out or flat out fail, we are sorry. We pray, O oh God, for your mercy and your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, the power and love of Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. Believe the good news in the gospel. You are forgiven and you are free to go and serve the Lord with creativity and imagination. Thanks be to God. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from a book in the Bible that very few Presbyterians read. It is a book in the Bible, actually, that very few Christians read, for that matter. It's one of the only two books in the Bible that does not mention God, the other one being Esther. So that may be one reason why folks don't usually turn to the Song of Solomon. There are no pithy verses in this book about God. Instead, this is a book about love, and in particular, what we might call romantic love or even carnal love. It's a, a book of love poems, some of them a bit graphic in a biblical sort of way, and, and I suppose it is the latent Puritanism in the church that steers us preachers away from this book. But today, in our examination of the fruit of the spirit of love, we are looking at another one of our four Greek words for love, and this one is the word eros. We've looked at storge, family love, we looked at phileo, friendship love, and today it is eros love, romantic, carnal, sexual love. Eros, from which we get the word erotic. Erotic is not a word you hear much in church, so you may already be starting to feel uncomfortable. But along with the rest of the loves, eros is so basic to our human nature, it's pretty strange that we don't talk more about it, at least from the pulpit. So today, we let the poetry of God's word open for us this subject of eros love. The Song of Solomon, chapter 2 verses 1 through 17. Hear the word of God. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among maidens. 
As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his intention toward me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. Oh, that his left hand were under my head, and that his right hand embraced me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles of the wild does, do not stir up or awaken love until it is ready. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the covert of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the cleft mountains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, by your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ. For we pray this in his name. Amen. When I was in third grade, I wrote a note. It was on a piece of loose leaf paper. And the note I wrote said this, Dear Cindy, I like you, Steve. I folded it up about eight times, put Cindy's name on the outside, and raised my hand and asked if I could sharpen my pencil. When given permission, I conveniently passed by where Cindy was sitting and slid the note onto her desk. I sharpened my pencil and then returned to my desk and then waited for the moment of truth. She sat, she sat a few desks behind me, so every once in a while I would casually look back for the opportunity for us to exchange glances. And the first couple of times I looked back, she was looking elsewhere. But then finally came the moment when we locked eyes and she smiled. Oh my goodness, my little third grade heart began to melt. Later at recess, we stared at each other from a distance. And after school, I got the nerve to catch up with her as, as she walked home. My legs were putty, my mouth dry. We probably said three words to each other. But the romance of the century was on its way. Three weeks later, we were through when Mike Grimmer captured her heart. Love is not an easy game. Love is not an easy game, especially when you are trying to find the love of your life. Notes get passed, kisses get stolen by the jungle gym, jittery fingers dial the phone for the first date, hands get held in the movie theater, gifts get given, dances get danced, knees get bent, and hands get asked for in marriage. It's a tough road, this thing called love, eros love, that is. For eros love is a capturing love. It's a, it's a love that sneaks up on you. We, we call it falling in love for good reason, for it happens to us like tripping over a crack in a sidewalk. Nothing planned, it just sort of happens to you. It happens upon you, and there's not much you can do about it. But there is much that it does to you. 
Eros has its way of flooding our brooks and overflowing our banks. It has its way of, of just taking over. There's no subject over which songs have been sung and poems have been written more than the gift of Eros love. How do I love thee, wrote Elizabeth Barrett Browning to her lover. How do I love thee? Oh, let me count the ways. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose. That's newly sprung in June, wrote the old Scottish poet. Oh, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. Something in the way she moves attracts me like no other lover, sang the Beatles. Something in the way she woos me. And of course, the great bard Shakespeare, being your slave, what should I do but tend upon the hours and times of your desire? I have no precious time at all to spend nor services to do till you require. And then, of course, from our sacred text, as an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his intention towards me was love. We all can agree, I suspect, that there is no more capturing love, and for most, there is no greater yearning than to find the love of your life, the love of body, mind, and spirit, the love of partnership, the love of soulmate, the love of physical attraction, the love of kindred spirits, the love of eternal joining. And when it comes, there is nothing more deeply and personally felt and nothing more difficult to explain. Everyone's needs for a partner is different. There's a lid for every pot, the saying goes. No one can explain the love one person has for another. God knows why the love of my life said yes to me some 39 years ago, but thank God she did. Eros is a mystery. You, can I, you and I can look at another couple and wonder what in heaven's name do they see in each other, but it's not up to us to judge, nor to evaluate, nor to express our opinion upon. For the truth is, over the history of God's people, the understanding of Eros and the understanding of romance and the understanding of covenant and the understanding of marriage has seismically shifted. For the longest time in scripture, the idea of the love of your life was very different than it is today. Many of the great heroes of the Old Testament had more than one wife. King Solomon, the namesake of our biblical book today, had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and still the Bible editors named a book after him. Of course, the idea of mutuality and marriage was something unheard of. Women were considered more property than partners, subject to the whims of their husbands. Jesus was considered a radical to suggest that men should see in a woman more, than, more a soulmate to be cherished than chattel to be exchanged. But even then, and for the next couple thousand years, it was still men with the upper hand. It took a long time for the idea of mutuality and love to take hold. And so even the idea of mutual romantic eros, covenant love, can meet up still with objections from family, from friends, from church, from government. When my mother and father fell hopelessly in love back in 1941 and in a couple of months decided to get married, my grandfather, my mother's father, was none too pleased. His biggest objection, outside the rush to the altar, was that she was marrying a soon-to-be minister. God forbid. Couldn't she marry a banker, a doctor, a lawyer, but some poor preacher? But love is love, eros is eros, and buried in a box of family papers, I still have the letter she wrote to her father explaining all the reasons why she had met the man of her dreams. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Love defies all logic. Love defies all prohibition. 
When my spiritual hero, C.S. Lewis, a confirmed bachelor most of his life, began to correspond with an American woman, Joy Davidman, back in the early 50s, a former communist, she, a former atheist, and soon to be divorcee, what he didn't know was that with each letter received from her, quite strangely, quite miraculously, an affection began to grow within his heart. And when she came to visit, the affection grew further. And when she moved to England, it grew further. And when she was diagnosed, with bone cancer, he realized that he had fallen in love with her mid-50s and for the first time falling in love. Would you marry me, he asks her at her hospital bedside. Yes, she says. The only problem was that she had been divorced and that the Church of England prohibited the marriage of those who had been divorced, but, but they were in love and the poor woman was dying. Couldn't God give them this gift of marriage before the end of her days? Lewis visited the bishop and presented his case and the bishop said, no, it's the rule. He had found a technicality big enough to stand in the way of their consummating this gift they felt so deeply inside and when you believe one that they believe that God had given to them. So Lewis, the great giant of the church, visits a local parish priest, a friend of his, Peter Bide, and begs him to preside over the sacred vows they wish to take to be married in the eyes of God. And at the risk of his ecclesiastical career, Reverend Bide steps outside the bounds of canon law and pronounces them husband and wife in the eyes of God. How could you do otherwise? How could you deny this sacred journey of Eros love? There is such mystery, isn't there, in this intense and deeply personal gift that God gives us in Eros. There's, there's no explaining it. There's no describing it. There's no analyzing it. It's just something that happens, something that captures, something that envelops. And the, and the church of Jesus puts a liturgy around it and says that when two souls fall in love and wish to form a covenantal union and pursue the long and winding road of two becoming one, that it is a most sacred thing. It is a holy thing, isn't it? Eros is not casual. It's not random. Eros is not just what feels good. Eros is intimate, vulnerable. Eros is holy ground. When we join ourselves to another in body, mind, and spirit, we are entering the sacred space of another human being. We welcome, at least we should then, the blessed presence of the author of love. We invite God to join us in our longing and in our bonding. And yet, as mysterious and sacred as such longing is, we still manage to find ways to stand in its way. It wasn't until 1967, for example, when most of America, most of the church was still saying, that interracial couples had no sacred love. It wasn't until 1967 that the Supreme Court of the land stepped in and said that such prohibitions are inhuman, that they take away the right that God intends to express and make sacred this eros gift between any person of any race, this expression of authentic mutuality, this covenantal partnership. And because this gift of God is so sacred, so personal, so mysterious, and because we have let too easily in the past our prejudices blind us to the human and spiritual yearning of others, the church is beginning to see that when folks of the same gender are so captured by such love, who are we to stand in the way of allowing them this loving journey of partnership and union? For it is not good for the human to be alone, God says back in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. It is not good to keep a soul from joining with another soul to experience the fullest measure of authentic partnered love of body, mind, and spirit. The joy and comfort that I take for granted is a joy and comfort God intends for every human being who is granted the gift of another soul with whom to be one. We all need someone, don't we, to join us in the journey to partner with us down life's uncertain path. It makes me think of the story of Jim McKay, 
<clears throat> Jim McKay, the famous sports broadcaster who died several years ago, told of the fact, the astonishing fact, that this famous broadcaster who looked so cool and calm and composed on camera as he reported to some of us, to some, the greatest moments in sports history, including the hostage crisis in 1972. That This man who seemed to have it all together on the screen, Jim McKay, suffered from a profound anxiety before the camera. He was embarrassed about his short stature and what he considered his below average looks. It led to a nervous breakdown when he was young. But about a year after a year of recovery, McKay, McKay used to say that from then on, whenever he went to the camera and faced the camera to face the millions of people who were tuning in, he would not let himself think about the millions. The only person he thought of was his wife. It was the only way of getting through a broadcast, pretending that the only person he was talking to was his partner. A conversation with his beloved Margaret. Holy ground. And it is that holy ground, isn't it, that God from the very beginning has wanted for his children, for them to know that they are not alone, that there is someone in the crowd, the big, big crowd, who returns our gaze with a smile, who cheers for us from the other side, who still sets our soul aflutter. So I remember the time when my granddaddy died the man who so worried about the poor preacher as son-in-law and who came to love him and welcome him and, and respect him. We, we got the news of his death and made our way down from Michigan to Pennsylvania for his funeral. The day before the funeral, we spent the better part of the afternoon and evening at the funeral home greeting well-wishers as was the custom back then. Granddaddy had a lot of friends and colleagues from the town where he had lived all his life except when he was away in the trenches in France during in the Great War. It was quite a crowd that, in that funeral home, and I remember those people from a few years before when they had come to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Grandma and Granddad, Bob and Josephine. I remember when the evening drew to a close and the crowd had all gone to their homes and the last visitors had paid their respects. It was just us family there, and, and we all gathered at the casket to say goodbye for the last time. And after a moment, we all stepped away to give Josephine her time, her time with her beloved. And for a moment, she stood alone, glancing at the man with whom she had first exchanged glances over a half century before. And then it was her hand. It was her hand laid on top of his folded hands those hands that enfolded hers so long before. And then a pat, a pat goodbye. Out of all the crowd, just one, one soul, one pat, one goodbye. So we pass our notes and steal our kisses hold our hands and bend our knees and ask for forever. For Eros has come and filled our brooks and flooded our banks and led us to the one who will join us and with God's help join to us. The one who will become one with us. The one who each day will say hello and one day Say goodbye. Lord of all creation, water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond the galaxy You are holy, holy The universe 
declares your majesty you are holy holy lord of heaven and earth lord of heaven and earth May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.